Okay, so please be seated, everybody, and um, we will start with our uh, new session uh, and start with um, unpacking, the packed unpacker. I'm not going beyond that. It's very difficult to pronounce for me. Um, I don't know if that's on purpose, but it's your, <laughs> yours now. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Unpacking the Packed Unpacker. I am Maddie Stone, and I am a reverse engineer on Google's Android security team. So sort of the whole point in why this matters is remembering that in malware analysis and defending, it is uh, us as malware analysis versus the malware authors. And each of us are striving for this asymmetric advantage where they want to be able to create, put malware out with less investment than it takes for us to detect it. So keeping that in mind, we come to anti-analysis. And basically this just means any techniques that make it harder for us as defenders to figure out what the malware is doing. So before we get directly into the library we're talking about, let's set the stage for how this happened. I was doing our a general reverse engineering, reviewing the list of apps that we have in a queue that, to determine whether or not it's malware. And the key is that I need to do it quickly because there are many apps in this queue and it's affecting, it's on users' devices and thus I want to protect them very quickly if it is. So the app looks suspicious, but I need to find the evidence. First though, interesting thing, the app won't run in any sort of dynamic analysis that I set up. Next, when I take a look at it statically, most of the code is native. It's not Java as you would expect in an Android application. And lastly, there were a lot of similar applications, meaning I really want to figure out what it's doing because it's more than just this one APK that I'm looking at. So if you're not as familiar with Android malware analysis, Android apps are in a file format called APK. Usually they're written in Java code or, or Kotlin, but that, all of that is in classes.dex. However, within the APK, you can include other files, such as natively compiled, so C or C++ compiled code, um, as libraries that the Java code can call and execute. So for us, that looks like a ELF with the shared objects file extension within the APK. And that's what we're gonna talk through and what I was reversing um, for this talk. So, Introducing Wedding Cake, because it's got lots of layers, and that's what we're gonna be going through and talking about the different anti-analysis techniques that they have. So the, all the different techniques that Wedding Cake decided to embed in this native library that has been included in many different applications is first, they do Java native interface manipulations, changing from the specific expected way that the JNI works. Next, they use some anti-reverse engineering techniques. After that, they use in-place decryption of the ELF. Finally, we get into 45 different runtime environment checks that include checking the system properties, verifying what CPU architecture you're running on, looking for monkey, um, which is a tap emulation type of software, and then finally looking for the exposed framework, which is a hooking software. So some of the first characteristics of wedding cake. The first, it's a native library, as hence by the title. Next, the title of the library as it's included in APKs is randomly generated and is usually three to eight random characters, lowercase characters. Next, all of the, because it's a native library within a Java application or Android application, it has to be called by Java code. So all of the Java code that interfaces with the native library is randomly generated class names um, in the sample that I linked to and talked through in this presentation. It was this really easy to discuss class name that's listed here. Lastly, um, within the ELF, there is usually two strings in the comment section of the ELF that are seen in Wedding Cake. The final sort of characteristics which are helpful in determining whether or not a sample is wedding cake is that there are two Java declared native methods, um, meaning that they declare the method in Java so that it can be called from the Java code within the application and is implemented in the C. And so the names 
are always changing within the samples, but they always have these two signatures. So the first one takes an array of objects, and the second one and returns an int, and the second one takes an int and returns a string. So these are really helpful for determining what you're looking at and where your analysis should be. Lastly, some of the samples have this third method, but it's not included in all, and I talk about that a little more in my paper. A next interesting feature um, of Wedding Cake is that it has been compiled for many different CPU variants, meaning that it is very likely distributed as source code. So um, the most common one in what I will focus on today is the ARMY ABI version, 32-bit ARM. Uh, the other three that I've seen, though, in samples in the wild is 32-bit ARM v7, ARM64, as well as x86. If you'd like to compare some of the different CPU variants or versions of Wedding Cake to each other, here is a sample. The short link goes to the virus total page so you can download the APK and you'll see um, the different versions of it there. What's interesting though, and why I only feel the need to focus on one through this talk and in the paper, is that across all of the different CPU variants, it has the same functionality techniques that doesn't change. They just compiled it for different CPUs. So what's the purpose of Wedding Cake? Why do you care? Why did I think it's worthwhile talking about? First, just until August um, of this year, there had been 5,000, at least 5,000 distinct APK samples I had found that included Wedding Cake. The next and why it initially ended up on my radar was that newer variants of the chamois um, Android PHA family uh, were using it. So this graph below um, shows the picture of the different stages of chamois that Google had posted in a blog post um, in 2017. And the key feature here that we're looking at is the stage three elf. After getting through all of the um, anti-analysis techniques of wedding cake, what I found is that they'd simply wrapped the initial stage three code and functionality in all of these wedding cake um, techniques. So wedding cake is a wrapper around what um, the malware developers want to hide. It's not in and of itself a standalone library. So that is how we came about unpacking the packed unpacker because stage three and chamois is an unpacker in and of itself. So they've wrapped their previous unpacker in <laughs> this. So analyzing wedding cake, here's a sample and again a short link to virus total if you're interested in looking or following along at some point. It's also listed in the paper. So the very first thing we need to start with is a very quick overview of the Java native interface if you've never looked at it. Basically, JNI allows developers to include compiled C or C++ code um, within a Java application and for us here that Java application is an Android application. So the developer will declare the native methods in their Java code just saying, hey, this is what I'm naming these functions, but they're actually implemented or C and C++. So in your Java code, you would see just these declarations, no code there, but any other Java code can call them and then they are run from what's been implemented in C or C++. To do this though, that elf or the library where those um, methods have been implemented have to be loaded into memory. So for JNI, you can do that and you call it from your Java code with either load library or load. When these are called in the Java code, it calls a function in the ELF library called JNI onload. And we'll get to why this matters. The next step in being able to use JNI and run native code in your um, Java application is you have to be able to do that pairing. So you've declared these methods as being native in Java, but they're actually implemented in the C or C++ library. And so you need a way for the interface to know, hey, whenever I call this method in Java, this is what you actually run in the native library. So there are two different ways of what they call registering this pairing. One is discovery, where you simply just name the function that's in the C or C++ native code with this syntax, java underscore class name underscore mangled method name. So that's a really clear, easy to find signal as a reverse engineer. The other method that you have to use if you're not going to um, name your functions that and want to strip the names from them is you have to use the register natives API call. 
And, but the interesting thing is the register natives API call re requires this struct that includes the string of the declared method name, the signature of the native method, and then finally a pointer to the function in C or C++. If you're not familiar with Java signatures, it looks like the one below. Here's our declared method in Java, and that's what the signature would look like. So it's a pretty easy to see pattern. It stands out quite a bit. So knowing this, I open up this elf of this app that I really need to determine if it's malware or not. And the very first thing I look at is checking to see if any of the function names have been named um, those native methods that were declared in Java. I know I'm trying to find what that functionality is because I saw in the Java code that they're being called at interesting points. And so I want to know what they're putting in the native code. But I can't easily find them in the function names within my IDA database. The next thing I look for is the strings section because if they're not using the discovery method of doing that pairing between the declared method and the implemented function, then that means they have to have the strings there because it's called register natives requires though, that. However, it's not there. There are no method names as strings and there are no signatures as strings either. So that means something else has got, got to be going on because it's required for the code to run. So I decided to back up and start with JNI onload because as I said before, that has to be run whenever the Java code calls load or load library, which is required to load it in ELF. So one of the interesting features of this library is that all the different Army ABI variants I have loaded into IDA, and none of them was IDA able to define um, the function. So it's, they see it as exported, but it's not defined because these two blocks that are highlighted in yellow are always defined as data rather than code. So once you redefine those as code, define it as a function, you, I started my analysis. And very quickly, something stood out. At the end of JNI onload, there is a long block of code that is calling the same function over and over again but with different pointers as arguments. And this is a really strong signal of encryption and decryption because they're running the same decryption function, that function that be, that's being called repeatedly, over different blocks of memory. So that is the next place I need to take a look because I still need to figure out where are those native methods um, that are declared in Java. So decrypting it is my next step. So I take a look at the decryption function and it takes four different arguments the pointer to the array of bytes that you want to decrypt, the length of that array, and then two different seed arrays. For every single call to decryption, these two seed arrays are, same, are the same in this library. So the next thing I needed to do was figure out what those seed arrays are because I knew I just wanted to decrypt this code. And I take a quick look at the generating the seed array algorithm, and this is what cleaned up IDA decompilation looked like. So kind of complex, not really clear exactly what they're generating. So I quickly do a basic translation to Python to, after hours of looking at this and decide to just run it to get the values of the two arrays. And what I find is it's two arrays from zero to 255. Um, so this is what stood out as the first anti-reversing technique because this is a much more complex algorithm than is necessary to allocate two arrays from zero to 255. So um, not very easy, but what I learned instead of in, what you should do instead of doing the same as me is next time I would just run it dynamically in memory and capture it. After presenting this talk um, at Black Hat in August, um, Chris Eng noticed that the constants in the generating seed array algorithm matches glibc's implementation of RAND, which is a simple linear congruential uh, generator. Um, and so the guess is that maybe they actually had been attempting to generate random values and did it wrong and shortened the period. And so based on the other changes they did, they ended up with two arrays from zero to 255. But either way, when you're a malware um, analyst, either start and just trying to get to the bottom of what something's doing, um, it can still look like an anti-reversing technique. 
So now I'm ready to understand what this decryption algorithm is doing. Or, but more importantly, I don't necessarily need to understand it. I just need to get the, what it, this ELF looks like when it's decrypted in memory. But the overall framework of what the decryption looks like each time it's called is it's past the array of encrypted bytes, it does the decryption, and then it overwrites the previously encrypted bytes with the new decrypted ones. So they're not writing it somewhere else in memory. As this load is happening, because remember this is in JNI on load, they're actually decrypting them in place. I have not identified this as any known um, encryption or decryption algorithm, but it's in the document and I also, uh, in my paper, and so if any of y'all do notice it as a known one, I'd be very interested in hearing. So at this point, I really don't care though to fully understand every aspect of it. I just want a solution that is going to decrypt it and show it to me what it looks like in memory and also be flexible and abstract enough that I can run it across the many different samples I have and not be dependent on the specific memory addresses um, or registers that the uh, disassembled version is now. So I chose to use an Ida Python script. Um, the script is open source. It's available um, in my Ida Python embedded toolkit uh, repo. And if you're more interested in hearing my thought process about how I build it, why I built it the way I did, um, you can check out both the paper or my Black Hat talk, which was a longer time period. So I run this Ida Python script over my Ida database of the library. And what I find is what previously looked like random encrypted bytes at the top, I now have all these strings. And that it is now showing me all of the missing strings that I knew how to be there um, that weren't in the original library. So now we can clearly see we have all those signatures we needed. And clearly we now have here a structure that points to the string of our method name, VXEG a string or a pointer to the string of the signature for that Java declared method and then the pointer to the function um, of where that code is actually implemented. So now we get back to our original goal of being able to reverse engineer and understand what um, the native methods were doing in the Java application. And this leads us into all of the runtime environment checks. So, from the malware author's point of view or the developers of Wedding Cake, the goal of all of these runtime environment checks is to detect if the application is being dynamically analyzed, debugged, or emulated, and they don't want to run in those cases. But what that means, and based on the checks they've chosen, they're also willing to limit the potential targets of where their malware is running in order to um, prevent them from being detected. And that gets into this sort of asymmetric um, investment between malware analysts and malware developers. They want to make it harder for us to understand what they're doing and willing to risk losing um, a small portion of the potential targets. So the very first, oh, I, I lost a slide. So I started my analysis of VX e.g. that function that we now know where the implemented pointers are. And that's where I saw this start of all of these different runtime analysis checks. So the very first steps of that function that we now have found um, is it goes through and checks the values of 37 specific system properties within the Android library. They're all listed in the paper as well as linked here. Um, but basically they're trying to check if you are running um, on an emulator or debugging board. After, if you've made it through all 37 of those checks, then it will um, check for the existence of any of the, these next five that are listed here on the right side. So VBox, um, Kimu, Goldfish, these are all emulators as well. So they're really trying to cover the different emulators in the space to ensure that they're not running. And so one of the key things that for all of these runtime environment checks, if a single one of the 47, I believe 45 plus, fails, it will call Linux's exit command and stop the application. The application won't run. So a single one of these will cause the application to no longer run. If you've made it through all 40 plus of the system property checks, the next thing they do is check what CPU architecture you're running on. Obviously, ARM is most uh, mobile devices. 
Um, and so that's what they're looking for. But to do this, they actually will read 20 bytes from the beginning of libc, which is the elf header. And then they will check two values there. First, eident e class, which is whether it's running as 32-bit or 64-bit, and then the machine. So they are looking for only two combinations are possible, 32-bit ARM or 64-bit ARC. This is especially interesting when, if you remember earlier on, I told you that there are x86 versions of this library about applications. So in those cases, um, it will still run the library up until this point and then fail. They're still in those x86 implementations looking to make sure you're running on ARM. The next runtime environment check they will look for is to see whether or not Monkey is running. So Monkey is a package that is used when you're running on an emulator to test and simulate user clicks, swipes, things like that. So you can test those without having to actually sit there and run them yourself. So the ways that they go about looking for each of these is they're going to iterate through every um, single PID directory under proc to see if they can find the monkey package names. Note that this no longer works on Android N+, but um, they still attempt it. In the case that it's Android N+, and it fails um, on opening proc, they will actually still continue. They only exit if um, they find Android or monkey. So this is the whole step of how they actually go about doing this, is that um, they look to see, after they've opened proc, they iterate through every node under proc, looking to see if it has the directory file type or not. Then they check to see if the name of that node under proc is an integer. They construct these two paths for com and command line, read 7f bytes, look through all, whichever one has more bytes, checking for monkey. The final sort of grouping of runtime environment checks that they'll do is looking for the exposed framework. So exposed is used to hook and analyze um, Android applications. Uh, so for here, what they will do is they look in proc self maps first and will look for libexposed art or exposed bridge.jar. And if either of those exist, it decides to exit. If that still succeeds, they want to do one more check to make sure exposed really isn't running. And that's when the, they will use the find class method for J and I and look for either of these two classes um, to see if it is in the application process. So we got to all of, we got through finally all of the different checks that Wedding Cake implements. So if you have gotten through all of these, not a single one of them fails. Then what I found was it had the exact same functionality as the earlier versions of Chamois that I had looked at for this application. So I got my answer of whether or not it was um, malware, but it took quite a bit of time to get there. So interestingly, before Black Hat, when I was writing the paper, everything here, I had been tracking, looking at the different evolutions of Wedding Cake, watch, looking at all the different samples, where it was used in the Android ecosystem. And so obviously, after going public with this, I was very interested in what would happen. So the biggest change is the ELF is no longer statically included in the APK. Instead, when you open up the APK, there's no longer a file of ELFs within it. They will now do a couple of different techniques to dynamically download the ELF and then run it. Um, but if you can get the ELF to dynamically download, then um, it's really just some cosmetic changes, I'm assuming probably to test if um, I was signaturing specific types of bytes or things like that within the library because they moved some of those decryption initialization contents just around, keeping the same ones but just putting them at different places and in different orders. Um, so that means the description Decryption script that I released still works. We'll still um, decrypt it. And all of these same runtime environments are the same ones that are being used. And there haven't been any changes to that yet. So in conclusion, um, one of the interesting things I found was um, as the low-hanging fruit in the Android ecosystem gets to be less low-hanging, basically. Um, we're seeing that 
malware authors are willing to miss out on some potential targets if that means extending their longevity and not being detected. And so they're putting more effort into developing complex anti-analysis techniques, cloaking techniques, things like that. What was interesting to me about this library too, though, was how they layered all of the different techniques. Because they target the human reviewer through anti-RE and decryption, or static um, reviewer in that sense. And then they also try and prevent dynamic analysis, as well as finally preventing debugging, um, emulation, and different things that might be in an automated pipeline. So I thought that was interesting in how they sort of broke it out to target those different reviewers. And with that, thank you. I'll take any questions.